Apart from the Earth, the next likeliest planet in our solar system to be able to support life is Mars. Yet these NASA pictures show a lifeless alien world. Could it be that Martian life is so unusual we just can't recognize it? Could it also be that intelligent life has passed through the solar system and we haven't noticed? Over 60 million miles away, about a year's journey by present technology, star watchers from London UFO studies constantly <coughs> ask similar questions. Two satellites go over, yeah. over the top, over the top of us. And For Roy for Lake and his group, star watchers are a regular event. Most times they see only planes. Occasionally they see something odd, a UFO. I do know that they exist. They've been coming here for many, many years, and the evidence is there. It's overwhelming. It just needs the general public to come forward. Roy became interested in the subject over 30 years ago. Since then, he's examined hundreds of cases where people claim to have seen objects. The problem, he says, they're not believed. It, it really did look like a very, very bright full moon in the sky. Um, and, and coming down, I mean, you could visibly see it ascending. It was about 9.45 in the morning when Trisha McLeod's attention was first drawn to a bright light in the sky. She was driving through Edinburgh when a huge moon-sized object came into view. Just gone over the roundabout at the main Milton Road and uh, there was a very, very bright light in the sky and it was very definite in shape. As I continued up this uh, particular street and down it came until it was really very near me. So I was sitting in the uh, right-hand lane, about to turn, and uh, it materialized into a spaceship. Almost disbelieving her eyes, Trisha stopped the car and got out for a better look. And the only way that I could say I could describe it was it looked a bit like Saturn, but the, the ring that was going round it had lights, windows. Once at home, though, she failed to persuade her husband that what she'd seen was real. I came home, I told my husband, who's a uh, local policeman down here, and he uh, went into fits of laughter and said, you know, you don't expect me to tell anybody this, because I, I wanted him to phone up Larry F. Turnhouse and find out if there had been any reports of flying objects that morning. As a respected international investigator and author, Timothy Good has read many UFO reports. 80%, he says, can be explained away easily, but the rest, stories of noiseless, strange moving lights, can't. Some of these vehicles appear to be able to change shape, or at least to appear to be able to change shape. In my view, that could be related to a type of propulsion system which distorts not only space, but time as well. On a November evening about 10 years ago, Linda Jones took a young son and daughter for a walk along a Manchester canal bank. Suddenly they saw a bright light in the sky. It looked like it was going to hit us directly. We ducked into the grass. It landed vertically in a field over a hill. We ran up the hill. We thought we were going to see a, an aircraft in flames or something. But it was just this object, total silence, not making any noise at all. It was then shaped like a half moon, really. Girder structure, the undercarriage of it. We stood there watching this object transfixed. And we stared at it. It was hovering two foot off the ground. It turned out that Linda lost track of about half an hour of time during the encounter. At first she told no one. Years later, under hypnosis, she recalls an experience on board the craft, but she doesn't like to recall it now. I don't think I should remember. I, I think whoever blanked my mind out, or if it was fear that blanked my mind out, I do not know, but I know that I should not remember. Tales of disturbing encounters are fairly rare. Skeptics say it's easy to be spooked by tricks of the light, for example, from low-flying aircraft. 
Most of the solid evidence for UFOs is collected by interested groups like Quest International. They say worldwide millions of people are convinced they are real. Last year a Skywatch team led by John Holman saw a UFO and filmed it. As best my memory can tell, you know, where this point of light had been, it was suddenly its place was taken by a large sphere of orange light. It was perfectly symmetrical, there was no flickering to it, or it, was perfectly sh it was absolutely sharp in the black sky, which is the unusual observational aspect to it was. It was as if it was like a little planet had suddenly materialised in the sky. The object only lasted for a few seconds before it disappeared, leaving the moon alone in the sky. John estimated that it was three miles away, hovering over a ridge. Fortunately, we've got the moon in the same shot, which is very lucky. We've, I've been through some triangulation, measuring the objects off against the size of the moon. Um, it measures just over half the apparent down to the moon, so it's quite easy calculation. And conservatively, it works out at about 70 feet in diameter. All three of us confirmed that had there been anything to structure it by, like a house or a, it would have dwarfed, you know, an average house. This huge UFO is said to be a mile wide. It's been That's seen over Puerto Rico, according to Quest's director of investigations, Tony Dodd. He says several US military aircraft have been snatched from the air. Right, that is the main UFO which the people in Puerto Rico say is abducting aircraft. They reckon this UFO is over a mile across in size. That was a picture done by the UFO artist Jim Nichols from photographs taken in Puerto Rico. Can you put the next photograph on? That is not a very good photograph. It's actually um, a colour photostat copy of a photograph of one of these interceptions. The Puerto Rico story has prompted much interest from UFO watchers or ufologists. I'd like to ask you a few words. Uh, when Captain Graham Shepard came back from a tour of the area, they were keen to know his story. Uh, the explanation uh, of everybody that we spoke to was that they were craft of some kind from elsewhere. It seems to be moving, um, how can I say, up the agenda of awareness to the extent that nobody was um, prepared to claim that, that these phenomena were lights in the sky or Venus or geese or aeroplanes. They were quite matter-of-fact about the possibility that these were spacecraft. Quest claims that the slides have been checked by NASA and shown to be genuine photographs. Well, my own view is that they were seeing um, products of a very, very advanced uh, technology, civilization, possibly. Um, their ability to, to change their uh, flight characteristics, which are completely different from ours. For example, they can, they see very large craft seem to be able to hover and to accelerate and to change direction at, um, at such a rate that, that completely defies what one might call our laws of aerodynamics and gravity. Tony Dodd says there is other documentary evidence for military UFO contacts. Well, I have a wealth of information which has come out where they actually talk on these documents about these UFOs being able to beat our defense systems um, and on certain occasions have been known to land on American Air Force facilities. Uh, they got very, very worried about this at one stage because certainly every nuclear site, every site which had missiles, at one stage or other has been penetrated by these things. And it is very, very obvious they are watching what we are doing from the point of view of our um, building these um, weapons of mass destruction. In 1970, the now deserted RAF base of Binbrook in Lincolnshire was active in the defense of the country. The base was home for English electric lightnings, fighter aircraft ready to be scrambled should any unknown objects enter our airspace. On Tuesday the 8th of September, the alarm came. An American pilot, Captain Schaffner, was first in the air to meet the UFO, but he never came back. From a military point of view, it's embarrassing to admit the existence of alien vehicles coming into our airspace against whom we have inadequate defense. There have been numerous instances involving aircraft UFO chases 
In his book, Ghost Stations 5, Bruce Barrymore Halpenny, a military historian, tells of a mysterious UFO chase. A retired RAF crash investigator, Mr. Halpenny, says it wasn't easy checking the story because of secrecy surrounding the case. It was a normal routine UFO sighting when the alarm was given, Captain Schaffner scrambled his lightning and he was certainly a very experienced lightning pilot and he loved to fly the lightning. He's 6,000 hours on fast jets, a very, very experienced pilot. This is fire squadron crew room and it was here that Captain Schaffner from this particular section behind the curtains here, this was the actual crew section that issued the order. From the door at the side, Captain Schaffner took the initiative to be first and upon hearing that there was a UFO, he immediately took the few paces along here to his lightning and was airborne within seconds. Two other pilots were scrambled at the same time and sent out over the North Sea. Their job was to intercept a radar blip which refused to answer repeated requests from the ground to identify itself. He reported that very bright lights. He was told then to proceed as close as possible and which is what he was doing when he was enveloped with a very, very bright light. At that stage, he said that his aircraft was still flyable but uncontrollable. The cl close proximity to UFOs has produced very serious uh, physical effects in the aircraft and in some cases uh, with the pilots. Communications are interfered with, weapon systems are interfered with. Now at this stage something, some malfunction with the lightning so he's immediately withdrawn and instructed to ditch. The story then is that A, immediately he ditched and seen to go down the Ministry of Defence issued a statement that the aircraft had broken up. Then stories start to conflict left, right and centre. The security blackout is immediately put over. Because of the design of the lightning, ditching has to take place at sea. A dinghy is provided. Mr Halpenny says that Captain Schaffner tried to eject, but the mechanism failed. On ditching, it's also possible to open the cockpit manually. A search and rescue team was sent. Captain Schaffner was never found. The blip had gone off on the radar, whatever it was had gone. The lightning floated for a, a short while and gently went down. It was sitting on the seabed. Perfect. There was no mark other than on the nose and the aircraft was, was in perfect condition. So and the canopy was closed. That's the sinister piece. The canopy was closed. The Ministry of Defence say this was a routine low-level night flight and the aircraft came down due to pilot error. The pilot escaped on ditching but was washed away by the tide. The release is between there and within a split second he's gone. Should that not fire, there's also on the top manual so that it is impossible not to have fired. So for him to be missing, the seat still intact and the canopy on and closed means the mystery was absolutely unbelievable. All life on Earth depends on the sun, but it's just one of billions of other stars in the universe. If only a tiny fraction of those had similar planets, says the Royal Observatory's astronomer Harry Ford, there could be life elsewhere. The elements for life exist throughout space. The different elements like carbon, iron, potassium and so on, they're actually manufactured by nuclear fusion inside stars. So the materials are there throughout the whole universe. But that doesn't mean the universe is teeming with intelligent life. Even if there were other civilizations, the universe is so vast it would take millions of years for them to reach us. In any case, we would have detected their radio communications before now. It would be stupid to say that there were no other intelligent beings out in space, but I'd love to see the evidence that they have actually visited. It, it seems a strange method of exploration, 
can you imagine Captain Cook arriving at a South Sea island, he lands on the beach, he sees the inhabitants and immediately leaves. Lack of concrete evidence has always prevented the Ministry of Defence from taking UFOs seriously. Ralph Noyes was a senior civil servant there. Part of his job was to deal with the public on defence matters, including the UFO phenomenon. The Ministry line was polite, but dismissive. I had a serious job to do with the air staff. They needed to have confidence in me and me in them. You didn't want to look like a flying saucer nutter. So it was always with a slight smile or a laugh that um, one would pop into Air Commodore so-and-so's office and say, look, we've, we've got another bunch of sightings, several of them this time, uh, up in Yorkshire or somewhere. Um, we'd better have a look at them. Uh, would you let my division know how we should reply to the kind people who've written? Um, uh, and the reply would come back, nothing we can see, uh, doesn't look like any defence interest. That was the kind of reply the public got. Most of the Ministry's UFO reports have been destroyed. They say there's no evidence to support alien craft. At the Public Records Office, some documents, though, are available. Before 1967, the Ministry of Defence would generally dispose of any documents relating to UFO incidents after about five years. Since then, any documents are subjected to the standard 30 years secrecy. Nonetheless, amongst the thousands of files on display here at Kew, there are some that date from the 1950s including this one from RAF Tocliffe. Here in this confidential Air Ministry report are several accounts of lights and objects seen over RAF bases. Like, for example, this report from the commanding officer at Tocliffe. He talks about all this occurred in a matter of 15 to 20 seconds. The acceleration was in excess of that of a shooting star. I've never seen such a phenomenon before. The movements of the object were not identifiable with anything I have seen in the air and the rate of acceleration was unbelievable. And that's backed up, too, by letters from members of the public. It may interest you to know that the object that some of your officers saw recently would be true, as I saw the same thing on July the 26th. Another one. I should like to corroborate what the ten officers and men said they saw in the sky on Friday afternoon. There are dozens more from witnesses to strange sightings. I think when one talks about the UFO topic, one's embracing an enormous range of things, a lot of misperception of astronomical things, weather balloons, what, what you like. Some of it is, uh, uh, I should think, um, sightings of advanced gear that's being tested. For many years, the stealth fighter was denied by the Americans. Yet it must have flown for testing and people could have seen it. The question for ufologists is, could such a strange craft be interpreted as a UFO? Quest's Mark Birdsall thinks secret testing could explain some sightings. I certainly don't think it can explain everything, but I think if you look at the phenomena as a whole, uh, especially from a historical point of view, most of the, the recorded observations of UFOs or flying saucers from 1947 to possibly 54 were of daylight discs and very, very physical objects. UFO pictures from 20 years ago are generally simple saucer-shaped objects. They're metallic like round aircraft. So, could that be a clue to their origin? During the 1940s, Germany was leaping ahead with advanced technology. They pioneered the V-2 rocket. Yet Mark Birdsall claims their efforts were also behind an even more adventurous project, the V-7, an advanced circular aircraft. I've been researching on the V-7 for something like 10 years now. We have contacted some people, some authorities, who were willing to divulge at least part of the information. There are blueprints. We have, as I say, verbal sworn testimony that they actually witnessed the, the, the construction of the disc. Basically, we are looking at a circular aeroplane, and the sooner people accept that things like this exist from a UFO point of view, you know, at least if we have knowledge of our own capabilities, then we can progress further. These blueprints came to light in a German magazine, Brissent, in 1978. According to the publication, this drawing was modified by the German government to make it safe for publication. Most experts agree the drawings are bogus, but the question remains, could they have been elaborate versions of a real original? 
This circular plane is just one piece of evidence which Mark has obtained to justify a German interest in the development of new aircraft. Over the years, several German publications, including Luftfahrt International, which specializes in aviation matters, have also documented the saucer story. They appear to be jet-powered aircraft capable of 2,000 kilometers an hour. Most of the work is credited to two scientists, Dr. Mita and Rolf Schrieber. It is alleged that the Americans and, and the Soviet Union did actually capture one or two of these flying discs intact. That is some intelligence information that the Americans began a similar project. It also turns out that in the 1950s the Americans and the Canadians were also involved with a project developing a circular jet-powered vehicle. The Avro car was abandoned in 1959 but could it have been a precursor to highly advanced craft that could have been mistaken for UFOs? In the United States of America, Mr. Bob Dean. On a visiting lecture tour of Europe, American Bob Dean addressed one of Quest's gatherings. Bob says he was involved in the military for over 23 years and had access to classified documents. He claims alien technology has been retrieved from crashed vehicles. When this first began to happen years and years ago, from about 1947 on, our government and I, your government was involved with a cover-up because the evidence that they had collected was so frightening to some of the military people and some of the politicians that they made the decision that this information could not possibly be released to the public because the public was not sociologically or psychologically prepared for it. There's speculation that at this secret military base in Scotland, the latest experimental aircraft, Project Aurora, is a regular visitor. Some UFO experts say features of the design are based upon alien technology. An expert in aircraft recognition, Chris Gibson, could well have seen it. In August 1989, I was working on a drilling rig in the southern North Sea. On the looked up, I saw a formation of four aircraft. The lead aircraft is a KC-135 tanker. Off the port side of the tanker were two F-111 bombers. But underneath the tail of this tanker was a black triangular aircraft, which I'd never seen before. My initial reaction was it was a, an F-117 stealth fighter. But this aircraft was too big and it was far too perfect. It didn't have any wing surfaces or tail surfaces, pure triangle. Hidden in the Nevada desert near Las Vegas is an American Air Force base. It's said that the Nellis base is used to develop all the latest military aircraft. This amateur video shot last year is of a frame-by-frame -frame animation of a high-speed vehicle flying through the mountains. It was all shot by Ray Wardle. The Aurora um, I'd first seen that at, of, of a night time, and it comes in over Las Vegas, where it's very bright, but it looks just like a shooting star. And during the daytime, uh, probably 18 months, two years ago, I set my camera up and filmed out at Red Rock Canyon area, which is um, west of Las Vegas, and I just let the camera roll. And when I replayed the tape frame to frame, you can see these vehicles flying at probably six to 10,000 miles an hour in between the mountains. This valley near Dumfries is a favorite training ground for NATO jets. It's also a good hunting ground for aircraft photographer David Anderson. On a walk near an abandoned airbase, he managed to take a picture of an unusual object in the sky. Went for a walk down the, the old runway at Heath Hall. I noticed this object flying away from the centre of the cross, took the camera away, looked up again, saw it again, and put my camera back up and started taking about 12, 14 photographs of it. And when I got back to the house, I told my family what I'd seen, they said you better phone the Civil Aviation Authority. So I phoned them and they, they said they would check up on it and come back onto me. So I took the film in to get it processed and came back home <clears throat> and the police were in the house to see me, ask if there were any photographs, negatives or anything. But he never saw the prints. 
The photographers who were developing the film said it hadn't come out. A few weeks later, they closed down. Military expert Mike Gaines doubts Aurora would have come to England, but it could have been made. It's purported to be a high-speed, high-altitude aircraft, as I say, uh, thought to be developed in the USA for strategic reconnaissance to take over from the SR-71 Blackbird. Um, the US Air Force denies it. Uh, they might well be telling the truth, but uh, there are other agencies in, in the USA which could fund such a program, specifically the CIA. Just to give you an example, the American taxpayer pays $50 billion a year in what's called black budget programs, and most of that is in the UFO field. Getting these prototypes flying, trying to develop systems of our own, learning what we can about propulsion, the specialist aircraft magazine, Jane's, recently published artists' impressions of what the craft could look like. It's said to be capable of six times the speed of sound. I believe that there was probably craft captured, alien craft captured, or crashed, or whatever, and we are trying to develop similar craft with earth earthly technologies and earth earthly metals and so forth. So they're probably back engineering these vehicles. But I do believe that the ones which I've taped, anyway, I've flown by either US military or the US government or whatever. We asked Clifford Beale, an aviation expert from Jane's, to look at Ray Wardle's film from the Nevada desert. Could it have been the secret Aurora project? It appears to have uh, uh, a, a flying wing shape, which is different than what's been attributed to Aurora. Uh, I don't think this could be. Uh, Aurora is a high-flying uh, uh, reconnaissance aircraft. Um, you wouldn't be testing it doing uh, ground-hugging uh, flying uh, techniques. Uh, it could indeed be uh, another secret uh, uh, aircraft undergoing testing. Uh, it's certainly in the correct um, uh, area. So have the Americans been developing a series of stealth-type aircraft which people could think are UFOs? And what about the stories of crashed alien vehicles? It's true. We, we in the United States have retrieved several crashes. We've retrieved the hardware and we've retrieved bodies. And in some cases, we've retrieved living crew members. Evidence to support the crashed vehicle hypothesis was found by UFO experts here in these isolated woods owned by the Forestry Commission. Strange objects were seen over the forest by soldiers guarding the nearby military air bases of Woodbridge Bentwaters, jointly run by the RAF and the United States Air Force. Men at the base saw lights for two consecutive nights. On the first night, men reported lights inside the nearby forest, but no formal investigation was made. It was on the second night, December the 27th, 1980, that lights were seen again hovering over the end of the runway. At about 11 o'clock in the evening, Jerry Harris, whose bungalow overlooks the base, saw what he first thought were the lights of a plane, but he soon realized that it couldn't be, because they were on course to miss the runway and crash. They weren't sort of uh, nice, steady, they were moving about. So I ended on the front door of the house and walked out into the yard here where I am now, and uh, just stood watching them. You see, it was all quiet, and, and I listened, I couldn't hear any sounds at all. Guards posted near the end of the runway also saw the lights and reported them to the base commander, who told them to stay on post. He would investigate. On the 13th of January, a surprising two weeks later, Colonel Charles Holt of the United States Air Force sent a memorandum of his findings to his superiors. It mentioned strange glowing objects in the forest, depressions in the ground, and a craft that emitted red sunlight that pulsed. I asked him, did he think he was one of ours? one of theirs, or Russian, and he said none of them. Manchester solicitor Harry Harris has kept in touch with Colonel Holt ever since the incident. He even went to see him at the Bentwaters base. He showed us a thick file of um, diagrams, drawings, statements by the various individuals and witnesses involved. <coughs> and he also played a tape to us of a uh, sound recording of part of the event, the UFO chase through the woods. Blast, what looks like a blast, uh, up here, yeah, 
According to Colonel Holt, this recording was made while he and some men went into the woods to investigate the previous night's sightings. They're using instruments to check for radiation. I was watching them and they were going up, moving about this way and that way, and they were going up and they were coming down. And uh, I thought I watched them for uh, three quarters of an hour. And all of a sudden, they disappeared. But just before they went, before they disappeared, there was a lot of activity on the base. I could hear vehicles running around. I could see the flashing lights of vehicles moving about. It's thought that this is where the craft came down. At the time, it was heavily wooded, but storm damage has forced the Forestry Commission to clear the area. What happened that night may never be known, but with help from her co-worker, Dot Street, UFO investigator Brenda Butler decided to try and get at the truth. On the night, Brenda says, there's good evidence for a crash. The um, tops of the trees were all knocked off. There was burn marks on the ground. There was um, depressions on the ground. Uh, you know, and very shortly after that, the Forestry Commission came in and knocked all the trees down, cut all the trees down, really quickly. They told us it was because of radiation on the trees. It appears, now we know, that uh, a team of about three security officers went out in response to visual sightings of this object crashing down and saw a small object about the size of a car maneuvering in and out of trees and coming down close to the ground. They got so close to it at one point that one of them tried to climb on top of it and was literally spaced out by the experience. Bufora investigator and author Jenny Randalls had the tape examined by audio experts in America. She says it wasn't a hoax made in a studio. Colonel Holt just acted on his own initiative and made a recording of the investigation. Holt appears to have been as surprised as everybody else was. The British uh, squadron leader who was in charge of the base certainly also was mystified as to why there was no follow-up by the Ministry of Defence, as to why this whole thing was basically left as it was and this is the position we got in the letters from the Ministry of Defence afterwards. They told us that they didn't proceed with an investigation because they didn't consider it to be of defence significance. But how did they know that it wasn't of defence significance? That implies that someone somewhere in the upper echelons of government knew exactly what was going on. 30 foot in diameter, um, with three tripod legs coming down and lights beaming down with aliens. Um, little aliens about two or three foot high in it coming down. Um, there's other ones who have described it as a, like a, a, sh a shape like um, a shell, a big silver shape. And others have shaped like, um, sort of like a tortoise shape it has been, like a tortoise back, um, with tiles on it. The investigating team sent out in 1980 have long since left the Bentwater base. It may soon close down. After the incident, says Brenda, men were quickly debriefed and held to secrecy. Many were sent to other posts in America, or even retired shortly afterwards. What was peculiar about the Ministry of Defence's response was that they were asked as early as early in 81, what went on around Rendlesham? Uh, were there not funny things seen on radar? Didn't something come down near this important base? And they said, no, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. And uh, uh, in effect, I think they lied, which in my day we didn't, we stalled. They say um, they have no interest in the event unless it has a defence implication. They say it has no defence implication, but they haven't investigated it. Uh, they say they haven't spoken to the eyewitnesses, um, and yet the operational staff have satisfied themselves that there was no evidence of anything having landed or intruded. Well, Holt and his band of merry men were operational staff. 
So from whence did the Minister of Defence get this information? UFO investigators claim at the time our authorities denied having any information about the incident. But in America, the Holt document was obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. Even so, the Americans had lost their copy and obtained one from our Defence Ministry. So why the secrecy? If you say nothing happened, were these men mad? If they were mad, why weren't they posted home? Whose finger is on triggers? That kind of awkward question would, would have arisen, should have arisen. And I think probably the MOD clammed up and actually got to the point of, of lying in order to avoid that embarrassment. Some experts said Holt had been tricked by the lights from a nearby lighthouse. This he denies. By present technological standards, the space shuttle represents one of our biggest achievements in rocketry. Yet it's still a very helpless vehicle with only a limited propulsion system. However, some experts claim that the Americans have developed a totally new space vehicle capable of very high speeds. The evidence for this comes from the release of pictures taken from the Discovery Space Shuttle in 1991. That's according to American Richard Hoagland. The sequence begins aboard the Discovery Space Shuttle, rolled over on its side and flying wings forward into the pre-dawn darkness of September 15, 1991. The shuttle is in orbit 355 miles above the Earth, just passing Rangoon, Burma, that brilliant collection of city lights below. Discovery Houston, while you're looking at Orion, we're getting a pretty tremendous light show. We're looking at the lightning on the These Earth. pictures are taken from a video detailing his analysis of the small objects floating outside the shuttle. Now pay attention to your screen at the top center. You'll see a dot of light appear and begin to move from right to left. Watch carefully. The dot will turn hard right, in apparent response to a brief flash from the lower left. Three seconds later, two contrails move sharply upward from the lower left. In my opinion, the NASA shuttle video you have just seen is among the most extraordinary pieces of footage in television history. NASA claimed that the dots were no more than space debris or ice crystals similar to those taken from an Apollo mission. Hoagland says these look nothing like the objects seen by Discovery. Our little dot is in fact drifting along at a leisurely pace of some 15 miles per second. That's about 54,000 miles per hour. When you see our little target object react to that peculiar flash, the undisputed star of our update accelerates in less than two seconds to over 200,000 miles per hour. And for those of you who may be wondering how many Gs this little guy experiences when it accelerates in reaction to that flash, its numbers clock out at a cool 14,000 times the Earth's gravitational acceleration. The object is a vehicle, but not alien, so it must be a secret weapon possibly based on alien technology. This has led us to this amazing conclusion. That the shuttle cameras that night somehow showed us an active Star Wars weapon system in Earth orbit. And the system is using our own American hyperdimensional technology for target practice. Years ago, UFOs were simple objects. Later sightings reported many lights. More recently, objects of a triangular shape have been seen. Could they be secret planes? Are people actually seeing extraterrestrial craft? Or is there some unconscious process taking place in the eyes of the witnesses, something that could convince these people in a Soviet Republic that they're seeing aliens? What's interesting about the development of the UFO reports, if you track it through time, because we now have about 50 years of reports where we can do that, is we can see that it follows what we call cultural tracking. It is exactly at the point where science fiction is predicting the technology of the future will go, but it's never beyond that level, which tends to suggest that it's something that we're perceiving, which fits in with our sort of stereotyped images of what an alien craft should look like. For hundreds of members of the Flying Saucer Observer Corps all over Britain, it's a serious search. This archive film gives the tone from 30 years ago, as people describe simple UFOs. One of America's leading experts on holiday in Scotland recently is Dr. George Hunt Williamson of Great Western University, California. I have actually seen the objects, and also I have seen many photographs of the objects. 
similar to this one, which was reproduced in Fly and Saucer Review here in England. They do become much more elaborate. They do change with time, the types of UFOs that are seen. Um, the current wave of UFO sightings, which is particularly popular around, UFO, uh, around Europe, is to see um, triangular-shaped UFOs. Now Hollywood has focused on the UFO phenomenon. The story that Travis Walton and five other witnesses told was so unbelievable. The feature film, Fire in the Sky, is the story of a real-life abduction. The famous case of UFO abduction ever reported. It happened to Travis Walton. It does uh, sum up the feelings, you know, the, the, that I went through. It's very hard to represent something visually that's going on internally and and so they had a problem they were trying to bring this you know into a, a something that can be seen you expect me to believe that a flying saucer came down and took your friend away to outer space James Garner plays a role that many abductees exactly will know happened. well is it? that of a very disbelieving is state it? investigator to story, you never even went back to the clearing so you don't know do you we all saw the guy get zapped. You saw something. At least you thought you did. You get this feeling of, uh, you know, they've got these these huge eyes and they're, and they're looking at me in a, in, a, in a way to where they just seem to look right into me. But then at the same time, without any hostility, it's different. When you sense that someone doesn't give a damn about you one way or the other, you know, that you're, that's not somebody you're going to... Uh, place a lot of faith in. What the hell's he doing out there? Get back to the truck! What the hell is that? Whether abductions are real or just some trick of the mind still hasn't been proved. Perhaps the most convincing evidence for UFOs can be found in Brussels of all places. For a period of about two years, the whole country was affected by a wave of sightings. They'd been seen by witnesses, the police, and by local radar stations. The Belgian army was forced to take the claim seriously. They allowed their F-16 fighter aircraft to be involved in trying to intercept these UFOs. They had the full backing of the chief of the Belgian air staff, Colonel de Broer. Initially, uh, we thought that some of these observations were caused by uh, atmospheric interference, uh, such as weather conditions or uh, electromagnetic interference. Uh, but later on, we found out that at uh, certain moments, indeed, we could uh, relate one uh, visual observation with one observation on the radar. And of course then we said, uh, well, to have a confirmation it uh, may be very useful to have an additional observation from an aircraft. The aircraft were deployed as part of a routine training program. Most times nothing was seen except on one particular night. 